Hi, I'm Matthias Beck. I'm one of the authors of Computing the Continuous Discreetly. And in this video, we'll have a bit of an afterthought to chapter 11. We will show how Brion's theorem implies Erhard's theorem. More precisely, what I mean is Erhard's theorem for rational polytopes. So this is something we discussed in chapter 3. Let me remind you, we have a rational d-dimensional polytope, then the Erhard counting function L sub P of t is a quasi-polynomial of degree d and the period of this quasi-polynomial divides the least common multiple of the denominators of the coordinates of the vertices. This is what we called the denominator of P. So maybe we'll fix some notation here. So let's say um, K is the denominator of my polytope, then what this theorem predicts is that the uh, lattice point enumerator should be a quasi polynomial of period dividing k. And I want to think about this quasi polynomial as a list of polynomials that run through cyclically as t increases and the cycle length is k. What I want to show you now is another proof of this theorem. I want to remind you how our proof in chapter 3 went. We took our polytope, went one dimension higher and considered the cone over p, and then we studied the cone through some triangulation and wrote the Erhard series as a specialization of the integer point transform to then get a form of the generating function of the Erhard quasi polynomial from which we finally could deduce the form of this counting function. What I'll show you now is a completely different approach. I will stay in the same dimension and instead use Brion's theorem, which after all writes the integer point transform of p as a sum of integer point transforms again over cones, now the vertex cones, and then we'll study what happens when we dilate the polytope and we'll dilate the vertex cones. Both approaches have their advantages and disadvantages. My main reason to show you the second proof is just to give you another piece in your toolbox. Okay, so let me let me prepare you what we will actually prove. So if you think of the quasi polynomials given in this form, then you can concentrate on the following evaluation of your Erhard counting function. Namely, we will plug in um, R plus K times T into our counting function. And we will show that this is a polynomial in T for a fixed R. And my R will have values between 1 and k. I'm expecting a quasi-polynomial of period k. Then what I'm doing here, I'm concentrating on evaluations of a certain residue class mod k. And I can choose the uh, residue between 1 and k. So what we'll do now is we're going to fix the denominator, k. We'll fix an r between 1 and k, and then just consider t as my variable. I'm looking at dilations of the form r plus kt. I already announced that I will use Brion's theorem, so let me remind you. Here's the statement. We have a rational polytope, and then Brion says that we can write the integer point transform of p as the sum of the rational functions representing the integer point transforms of the vertex cones. Okay, so let me just copy the setup. So we have a rational polytope with denominator k. And we're fixing some 
integer r between 1 and k. And we wanted to uh, compute the error counting function at r plus kt. And so if I want to use Brown's theorem, well, I should express this as an evaluation of an integer point transform. So I'll take uh, the dilate r plus kt of my polytope. And if I want to count, I will plug in the all once vector into my integer point transform. Yeah, so this really is, uh, this is the vector one, 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 one. And now um, Brion says that I can write this integer point transform as the sum of the rational functions expressing the integer point transforms of the vertex cones. And of course, um, dilating the polytope means I dilate each of my vertex cones. So here I see uh, the integer point transforms of the respective dilates. But now if you remember, when we compute the integer point transforms of cones, the vector 111 was usually a singularity. And so I can generally plug in this vector over here, but instead I'm going to compute the limit as uh, z goes to this vector 111. Yeah, so again here z is a really a vector variable and so again this is a, actually a, a vector here. So each component goes to one. So what this suggests is we should study uh, what happens with each vertex cone uh, when we dilate like this. So let me say my vertex cone of course has apex v and then it has some generators and so let me just abbreviate notation and say so let's say we have generators w1 through wm and my notation here just means that we uh, consider all linear combinations with non-negative coefficients. Yeah, so we start at v and then have some coefficient in front of w1, some non-negative coefficient in, in front of w2, and so on. And so now what does dilation mean? So let's uh, dilate this by the factor that you want here, r plus k times t. Well, everybody gets multiplied, but now you can see that multiplying some multiple of, let's say, w1, does not change the description of the object that I have here. So again, I have some non-negative coefficients in front of my w1. So in essence, what that means is the only thing that happens is I'm multiplying the apex v. And so let me actually take this apart and first multiply v by um, kt and then by r. And then as we just said, the uh, other coefficients here remain non-negative. And so here's a description of the dilated cone. The message is that dilating a cone like this really just means translating the apex by the right amount. And if you think about this for a moment, this should make sense geometrically. Okay, so now let's go back to our game plan. So remember the only variable that I'm interested in is t. Everything else is constant. And so the only place where t comes into play in my description here is this first term. Let me call the remaining stuff over here is something. So what this is, is actually another cone. So maybe let me call this uh, KV wiggle. And so this is now what we'll work with. So this is where we are. We want to show L sub P of R plus KT is a polynomial in T where 
just to remind you, k was the denominator of p, and r is some fixed number between 1 and k. And we wrote this as the limit of a sum of rational functions coming from the integer point transforms of vertex cones. Sum goes over all the vertices, and we rewrote the dilated vertex cones in the form that you see over here. And so the first thing I will do now is I wrote here an integer point transform of a cone as an integer point transform of a translate of another cone. And so we know how to deal with translates. So this is simply a factor z to the translate times the integer point transform of this cone that gets translated. Let me make a remark over here. So you should feel a little wary about this because v is a vertex of my polytope. And so that's a rational vector. But you can see we're multiplying this vertex by the denominator of the polytope. So this here is an integer vector. And of course, t is an integer. So z to the t times k times v is a Laurent monomial. There are no rational numbers appearing in the exponent here. And of course, the cone kv wiggle is a rational cone. Let me remind you that it does not depend on t. And so what you see over here is some rational function. in several variables. Okay, so let's go back to the big picture. So we're writing this as the limit of a sum over all vertices. And what we're summing is this Laurent monomial, z to the something, times some rational function. Now let's think about this. So my rational functions on the right have poles when I evaluate them at each cj equals 1. On the other hand, I know this limit exists because it's a lattice point count. And so what I'm going to do is I will write this sum of rational functions with these factors in front of them as one big rational function. And then I will use L'Hopital's rule. Well, in my big rational functions, these Laurent monomials, z to the t times k times v, will appear. And L'Hopital's rule now says I need to differentiate a certain number of times. But differentiating these means that we will get some polynomial expressions in t. Because each time I'm differentiating this Laurent monomial, I will sort of get an extra factor of t. If you do this a number of times, you will get certain powers of t. And of course, we have a linear combination happening here. So we'll get some polynomial expressions in t but no worse than this. And so this means at the end of the day, we will have something where we can plug in each zj equals one. And so we will end up with a polynomial in t. And this is what we wanted to show.